Hello, my name is Crystal Collins, and I'm the Director of Clinic Partnerships and Business Development for Maven Project. Thank you for joining us today and our friends at Manic Community Health Center for hosting today's session, um, Atrial Fibrillation, the Most Common Arrhythmia Seen in Clinical Practice. Dr. Schulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School from 1988 until 2016. He is currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he has been practicing non-invasive cardiology since 1970. Dr. Schulman's scientific art articles and abstracts have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine Circulation, the American Journal of Cardiology, and the British Health Journal. His research interests include the treatment of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and hyperlipidemia. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Charles Schumann. Thank you, Crystal, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to our uh, little talk here, uh, which will be about the, the most common arrhythmia that's seen in clinical practice, seen in your clinical practice, seen in uh, my clinical practice, which is an outpatient cardiology practice, and seen by the electrophysiologists at the hospital um, who, uh, you know, who do ablations. So this is, this is the commonest one and uh, uh, is a reason for uh, uh, spreading knowledge uh, about it. Um, I have no disclosures, nor do any of the other participants in this uh, uh, activity. And uh, MAVEN is accredited by the uh, Accreditation Council uh, to provide CME credit. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, session will be uh, uh, available for uh, one hour of uh, Category 1 credit. So uh, the learning objectives of, of the talk are to understand a general approach to arrhythmias, to know the natural history of and risk factors for atrial fibrillation, to implement the ABCs of AFib management, and to appropriately prescribe anticoagulation medications in the proper, proper dose. Uh, so my approach to arrhythmias is, is something like this. Starts with look at the patient. There is no substitute for looking at the patient uh, or speaking with the patient. Uh, but in this context, what I, what I mean is, is the patient hemodynamically stable? If the patient is not stable uh, and has a tachycardia arrhythmia, you may need to cardiovert that patient no matter what they have. Um, uh, before making a definitive diagnosis. The second uh, part of uh, looking at the patient is to look for structural heart disease. Uh, get an echocardiogram. Uh, uh, this will tell you whether there's uh, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, um, uh, right-sided uh, abnormalities, and valve disease. Then, Look at, the, look at the ECG, and uh, on the right side of the screen here, there's a systemic approach to arrhythmia interpretation uh, called watch your P's and Q's and the three R's. Uh, so but, uh, let me get my pointer. There we go. Okay. So P, are there P waves? If not, uh, is, uh, are you dealing with atrial fibrillation? Q, is the QRS wide or narrow? Uh, which has uh, different meanings, of course. And the three R's, what is the rate? What is the regularity of the arrhythmia? And whether there's a specific relationship uh, between QRS complexes and a neighboring uh, atrial activity. Then look for and treat precipitating or reversible factors, including but this is certainly not an all-inclusive list, um, uh, electrolyte imbalance, ischemia, drugs, hypoxemia, uh, hyperthyroidism, and others, and then treat the arrhythmia uh, if necessary. There may be no treatment necessary, but uh, there are a number of modalities which are available uh, to us uh, in order to treat arrhythmias. 
Atrial fibrillation is a considerable problem. Uh, the, preval the prevalence and the incidence of AFib is increasingly uh, increasing in the United States, states and predicted to uh, go up even further. There are 50 million estimated individuals worldwide, uh, at least 5.6 million individuals in the United States. Um, you know, that was in 2015, it's probably more now. Uh, the overall lifetime risk is 30 to 40 percent in white individuals, 20 percent in African-American individuals, and uh, 15 percent in uh, Chinese individuals. Um, and it's uh, associated with increased risks, increased risk of death, increased risk of stroke, uh, increased risk of uh, cognitive impairment and dementia increased risk of heart failure, uh, and uh, it costs considerable amount of money. So this is kind of my introduction to, uh, to atrial fibrillation, and these videos actually uh, illustrate the difference between sinus rhythm uh, and uh, atrial fibrillation. So uh, in sinus rhythm, there is a coordinated uh, uh, depolarization starting uh, of the of the heart starting at the SA node going to the AV node down the bundle branches uh, uh, with coordinated contractions of atria and ventricles uh, following that uh, leading to an ECG, ECG that shows normal sinus rhythm. Um, contrast that to atrial fibrillation. There are upwards of 360 uh, of these little uh, wavelets uh, originating in the left atrium uh, and bombarding the AV node, and bombarding the, the right atrium also, but bombarding the AV node so that only some of them get through uh, 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 to varying degrees. And so with varying uh, penetrance, uh, there's more or less refractoriness and therefore an irregular heart rate. Um, so here's a, a patient, a 65-year-old lady <clears throat> with uh, diabetes, hypertension, who complained of shortness of breath and edema. Uh, the ECG shows a rapid, irregular, right? It's not regular. You can see here, uh, not regular, narrow complex, narrow QRS complex, arrhythmia, and this is... Uh, you can guess before you even you even look closely at the ECG, but you can guess that this is atrial fibrillation, which is what it is. Now, this is one of the uh, consults I got on Maven, a 54-year-old uh, asymptomatic man with hypertension uh, who has this ECG. The ECG shows atrial fibrillation, narrow complex, uh, the rate is controlled, but there's there are clearly no P waves, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so this is a fib atrial fibrillation. His Chaz vast score is one. We'll talk about that. Uh, the question is, should he be anticoagulated, and uh, uh, or should he receive aspirin? Um, these are examples of smartwatch recordings. Uh, uh, which uh, are, are, you know, now nowadays uh, readily available to uh, everyone. Uh, this is an Apple, Apple Watch recording uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation, and it's uh, pretty clear. The, the, you know, the, the watch interprets it as atrial fibrillation, and indeed, that's what it is. Uh, this is a recording of sinus rhythm with two premature beats. This one is me. Uh, and clearly sinus rhythm, okay? This lady, a 48-year-old lady, called me in a panic because her Apple Watch told her she was having atrial fibrillation. However, <laughs> if you look at it carefully, and I don't know if I can make this larger for you. Can you see that better? Yeah, there you go. Okay, that that's that's better. Okay, so you can see, you can see that this is not atrial fibrillation. There are P waves in front of the QRSs, 
one there, this one there, this one there. They're not, they're, they're sort of low voltage P waves, which is partly why the computer didn't diagnose it, right? And with premature beats, a couple of premature beats there, here, here. But this is, this is not a fit. So I was able to uh, easily reassure her that she didn't have atrial fibrillation, and she was very happy. <laughs> um, here's another patient, another consult I got, 71-year-old man who had persistent atrial fibrillation, asymptomatic, uh, for a, or a year, had a history of mild hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia controlled on a statin, his blood pressure was good. Uh, his ECG, uh, aside from the AFib, lab work and echo were all normal. His Chad's VAS score is two, um, one for his age and one for his hypertension. Uh, he's on uh, river roxaban, atorvastatin, and diltiazem. Uh, and the cardiologist told the primary care provider that he would be a great candidate for cardioversion or ablation. Question is, is that right? <laughs> or, or do we agree? Uh, we'll get back to that uh, toward the end. Okay. Now, atrial fibrillation <clears throat> is a continuum of disease. Um, it starts out as uh, paroxysms, uh, short episodes that last for less than a week and spontaneously terminate. So these light blue lines would represent uh, episodes or paroxysms of atrial fibrillation. That goes on to a persistent atrial fibrillation, episodes that last longer than seven days and don't spontaneously terminate, uh, which, go, which goes on to permanent atrial fibrillation, which is atrial fibrillation that cannot be converted. Uh, at the same time, there is remodeling in the left atrium both electrical remodeling and uh, uh, mechanical uh, remodeling in the, in the left atrium, uh, both of which contribute uh, to the recurrences of atrial fibrillation. Early in the course of the disease, triggers are, play an important role in, in, um, uh, in uh, inis initiating episodes of AFib, whereas late, in the, in the course of things, it's the substrate which is most important. <clears throat> now, a lot of what I'm going to show you comes from the recent 2023 uh, guidelines, a ACC, AHA, uh, Heart Rate, Heart Rhythm Society guideline for the diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation. Okay, it was uh, published uh, in January of 2024. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the this class of recommendations in these these and other guidelines, not just not just these guidelines, uh, they are as follows. A class one recommendation is a strong recommendation. The benefit is much greater than the risk, and so the the drug or the procedure uh, is recommended. A class 2A recommendation is a moderate recommendation. The benefit is greater than the risk, but it's not as strong as uh, a class 1. Uh, and it's it, you, you can think of it as being reasonable or can be useful, effective, beneficial. A class 2B recommendation is a much weaker recommendation. The benefit is probably greater than the risk, and it might be reasonable or might be considered. Class three is either no benefit uh, or harmful. Um, now, the risk factors associated with atrial fibrillation are uh, numerous. There are some non-reversible ones, such as older age, family history, uh, and some reversible ones. Uh, uh, and I've highlighted four here. And you'll find out why in, in just a, mi a minute. Sleep apnea, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Now, the, the new guidelines uh, talk about different stages of atrial fibrillation. They talk about people who, who might be at risk for atrial fibrillation. 
Um, and they talk about primary prevention of atrial fibrillation, which would in include treatment of hypertension, treatment of diabetes, smoking cessation, a reduction or discontinuance of alcohol consumption, an increase in physical activity, and the treatment of obesity. Um, and here are the stages uh, 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 of uh, the evolution of an atrial arrhythmia uh, progression. Um, these are similar to the stages of heart failure. Uh, so stage one is at risk. Uh, for atrial fibrillation, which might be the presence of modifiable uh, uh, presence of risk factors. Um, uh, and, and here's where primary prevention would, would uh, uh, be important. Uh, stage two is the, they, they call pre-AFib. Uh, there's evidence of structural uh, electrical uh, findings uh, that may predispose a patient to AFib, such as frequent PACs or left atrial abnormality on ECG. Stage three is the presence of AFib, divided into subcategories of paroxysmal, persistent, longstanding persistent, and uh, status post uh, successful ablation. Stage four is permanent AFib, where no further attempts at rhythm control uh, are being made after a discussion between the patient and the clinician. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, complicated. Uh, it includes what I just told you, uh, so that during all of these uh, stages, you want to treat uh, modifiable risk factors and then ongoing monitoring uh, to see if AFib is associated with pathophysiologic changes, stroke risk assessment, and uh, treating symptoms. Okay, so here are the pillars of atrial fibrillation uh, management. Number one, stroke risk. Uh, all right, SOS, right, stroke risk. Assess and treat uh, stroke risk. Number two, optimize all uh, modifiable risk factors. Uh, number three, symptom management. Uh, uh, trying to deal with the AFib burden. The AFib burden is the percentage of the time uh, that you're in AFib as opposed to sinus rhythm uh, with, uh, uh, with a rate control strategy or a rhythm control strategy. And we'll talk uh, more about that. Um, uh, you know, here, here is the risk factors that I already mentioned. Uh, treating, treating these does make a difference in, in atrial fibrillation. Uh, uh, heart failure, uh, exercise, hypertension, diabetes, to, uh, tobacco cessation, uh, obesity, uh, ethanol, and, and sleep, um, uh, meaning sleep apnea. So what to ask when a patient presents with atrial fibrillation? Well, what are the symptoms? Palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue. What are the circumstances? Is it postoperative? Is it in, in, in the presence of volume overload or heart failure? Uh, uh, has it occurred during sleep? Consider, consider obstructive sleep apnea. Are there autonomic triggers? Uh, is it uh, triggered by alcohol? And then what is the pattern? We've talked about the pattern. <clears throat> what, the, what should you order when a patient presents with atrial fibrillation? Well, everyone should have a TSH, although the incidence of uh, thyroid toxicosis or hyperthyroidism induced AFib is uh, not very great, but it, you know it's it's very treatable, so you should look for it. Uh, obtain an echocardiogram, the patient with AFib looking to assess LV function, identify structural heart disease, and then consider uh, testing for sleep apnea. You know, assess the risk for stroke. You do not need to evaluate uh, for ischemia every time a patient shows up with atrial fibrillation, with a paroxysm of atrial fibrillation. Uh, you do not need to restrict moderate caffeine, and you don't need to restrict uh, mild alcohol ingestion, um, unless it, it unless the patient can identify that uh, that alcohol is a trigger. 
Um, you know, when do you need to in hospitalize a patient? Uh, basically, it's because there are uh, other illnesses requiring hospitalization uh, or severe, severe symptoms, uh, whereas a low-risk uh, patient would be someone who didn't have any other illnesses requiring hospitalization and it, it was either converted to sinus rhythm or had mild symptoms and a controlled heart rate. Um, so here are the considerations, and, and uh, this is somewhat repetitious of what I've already said, but, uh, uh, you know, here, you know, given a patient with atrial fibrillation, uh, what do you do? Well, first, you, you do rate control uh, with, uh, you know, okay, first you do rate control, then uh, stroke prevention and anticoagulation, then treat risk factors, then develop a, a long-term strategy for reducing symptoms, uh, either maintain maintaining uh, sinus rhythm with uh, medication or catheter ablation, or uh, manage continued uh, atrial fibrillation. So looking at uh, stroke prevention, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, different uh, modalities for stroke prevention, pharmacologic uh, or non-pharmacologic. Pharmacologic would include warfarin and the direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, I would point out now and again that aspirin and or uh, clopidogrel are not effective, uh, so they don't count. And uh, this, this has actually been tested and found that they were not effective and that there was the same bleeding risk uh, as uh, a warfarin against which they were tested. Um, the non-pharmacologic me methods include left atrial uh, appendectomy at the time of surgery or the Watchman device, which is a per percutaneously uh, inserted uh, uh, left atrial appendage closure device. Okay. Now, how do we try to decide uh, whether to anticoagulate somebody for um, for atrial fibrillation. Uh, the commonly used score is the Chaz-Visk score. Okay, it, it assigns uh, points to a number of factors, including heart failure is one point, hypertension is one point, age is one point oh, uh, between 65 and 74, and two points over 75. Uh, uh, diabetes is a point. Stroke is two points. Vascular disease, uh, the other beds is uh, uh, one point, and female sex is one point. And the more points you have, the more uh, the higher is your risk. Okay. Uh, there are some additional risk factors that increase the risk of stroke, which aren't included, which include. Uh, a, a AFib burden and uh, AFib of long duration, uh, persistent or permanent AFib versus paroxysmal, uh, uh, the newer newer uh, uh, studies uh, using uh, uh, pacemakers or uh, uh, implanted defibrillators or loop recorders. Uh, record, uh, you know, the more you look, the more AFib you find. And sometimes the AFib is, you know, five or 10 minutes. Sometimes it's half a day. Sometimes it's a day or two. Uh, uh, but the more you have, the, the higher the risk. Uh, obesity uh, is, not, is not part of the score. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, or I should uh, include... Uh, uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy in here as well. Uh, poorly controlled, poorly controlled hypertension, a low uh, 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 kidney function, proteinuria, or, or an enlarged left atrial volume. So a large left, left atrium makes it uh, more more difficult to control AFib uh, and increases the risk for stroke. So, you know, and these, are the, these are the stroke risks, and these are the bleeding risks, right? The opposite of, the opposite of uh, 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 coagulation is bleeding. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
factors such as concomitant antiplatelet therapy and concomitant uh, NSAIDs are, are highlighted in red here because they're bad actors. Uh, uh, as somebody who's on a, 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 uh, an oral anticoagulant should avoid, avoid NSAIDs. <clears throat> Liver or renal dysfunction, alcohol use, uh, age is an important factor, which of course we can't control. Um, uh, prior interest to rebral hemorrhage, uh, prior GI bleeding, and Asian uh, ethnicity. There are bleeding risk scores like Hasbleds and Hasbled, which was uh, calculated using uh, warfarin uh, studies, uh, or uh, the newer DOAC uh, score, uh, which was calculated more recently uh, on patients uh, on DOACs. Um, uh, uh, this DOAC score uh, uh, differs from the Hasbled score uh, in a couple of ways. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are different, different. Uh, that, uh, although they, they assign, uh, they both assign risk of uh, major bleeding differently. Uh, uh, in in the DOAC score, the, the there is a quant quantification of uh, bleeding risk: very low, low, moderate, high, very high. Uh, uh, and the Hasbled score scores over fifty can indicate a high risk of bleeding. Um, and then there in the DOAC score, there's an age uh, stratification. Uh, and the renal uh, impairment classification is uh, um, more significant uh, uh, in the DOAC score. Uh, and of course, the impact of concomitant medications, NSAID use gets a point, antiplatelet use gets, uh, uh, well, aspirin use gets two points, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy gets three points. Um, having said all that, um, we generally uh, don't uh, calculate uh, each uh, a score for, for each person. I mean, you look at the bleeding risks and the general and the factors uh, and make your and make your decision. Um, uh, so uh, when you consider antithrombotic therapy and atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, the the uh, 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 there's a class one uh, recommendation for using the Chad's fast score, okay. And so, if the stroke or systemic embolism uh, risk is great, two percent or greater, uh, there's a class one recommendation for anticoagulation between one percent and two percent, which which is the same as a Chad's fast score of one. Um, uh, it's reasonable uh, uh, depending on the circumstances. So your anticoagulation choice, uh, the, the guidelines recommend uh, the, the uh, direct oral anticoagulants over warfarin uh, ex with, with two exceptions, uh, mitral stenosis uh, and mechanical heart valves. Uh, you see aspirin alone or with clopidogrel is, not, is, is a class three uh, recommendation. Um, there are some situations where long-term anticoagulation is contraindicated, including severe uh, bleeding from a non-reversible cause, um, <clears throat> spontaneous intracranial or intraspinal bleeding due to a non-reversible clause, uh, and uh, 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 spontaneous uh, or serious bleeding. Uh, related to recurrent falls when the cause of the falls is not felt to be treatable. Uh, Long-term anticoagulation is still reasonable uh, when there's bleeding only involving the GI pulmonary or GU systems that's treatable or bleeding related to trauma or bleeding related to procedural complications. Okay, now comparing, comparing uh, warfarin to the direct oral anticoagulants. Warfarin has a long half-life, uh, requires frequent tests, as you all know, the INR, uh, has uh, dietary restrictions because it's a competitor inhibit, inhibit, it competitively inhibits vitamin K in the liver. So the more uh, vitamin K uh, containing uh, foods that you eat, uh, the more warfarin you'll need in order to remain therapeutic. 
is once daily dosing. It's of course cheap, uh, and and the an antidote is uh, vitamin K. Uh, and this is the reason why the INR uh, between two and three uh, is the recommended uh, target range, because at INRs of less than two, the stroke risk goes up. At INRs greater than three and a half, the, uh, 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 the, the bleeding risk goes up. Now, the direct oral anticoagulants have much shorter half-lives, 5 to 17 hours. There's no testing. There are no dietary restrictions. There's once or twice daily dosing, a pixaband. Um, there's less bleeding for all of them than warfarin, uh, and they need to be adjusted uh, uh, with renal impairment, uh, and they're contraindicated in people with mechanical heart valves and moderate to severe mitral stenosis. I've already said that. Uh, and they are expensive, so that's that's an issue. Uh, there are antidotes. Um, th this shows the dosage adjustment uh, for uh, chronic kidney disease. So for apixaban, uh, which is generally considered to be the preferred uh, uh, DOAC, uh, uh, five milligrams BID is the standard dose uh, uh, and uh, can be given uh, at, at, at any uh, uh, creatinine clearance. It is it, it has the least renal clearance of the of the DOAX. Uh, in selected patients, that is patients who have a creatinine of greater than one and a half, age over eighty, and weight under one hundred and thirty two pounds, reduce the dose to two and a half milligrams twice a day. Uh, Dabigatran. Uh, lo lower the dose uh, uh, with CKD stage uh, four, uh, four. Uh, with a doxaban, the same, same uh, lower the dose uh, with a creatinine clearance of less than 50. Uh, and uh, with rivaroxaban, lower the dose with a creatinine clearance of less than 50. Uh, so here is a an 86-year-old woman with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, she has controlled hypertension, osteoporosis, uh, mild cognitive impairment, and lives in an assisted living facility. She presented with episodes of palpitations and heart, quote, fluttering, end quote, and was found to have paroxysmal AFib. In the last year, she's fallen twice without injury, her uh, uh, GFR is uh, 56. Uh, her CHADS VAS score is, is high, uh, four, two for her age, one for hypertension, uh, and one for being a woman. Her has bled score is uh, one, her DOAC score is six, both of which are moderate. And the question is, should she be anticoagulated? Uh, I'll, I'll ask that question and ask if you want to uh, uh, answer in the chat. I'll give you a minute to answer in the chat. Yes or no? No. Oh, okay. 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 We have a yes. We have a no. So we have mixed. Yes. Now it's two to one. <laughs> <laughs> There's a no, probably no, due to fall risk and advanced age. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, let me uh, uh, further state that elderly patients are at increased risk of both stroke and bleeding. I mean, we know that. But and this is, this is what I want to emphasize. The benefit of oral anticoagulation outweighs the risk of bleeding. Uh, somebody did a, stu a, a modeling study where they estimated that it would take 295 falls uh, to before uh, the risk of a subdural hematoma would outweigh the benefit of anticoagu oral anticoagulation. The risk of falls, therefore, is rarely a contraindication to uh, anticoagulation. Uh, 
uh, of course, shared decision making uh, and adherence to therapy are crucial to the management. Um, uh, I would anticoagulate this lady. I, I wouldn't have any problem anticoagulating this lady. Um, you know, even though she lives in an assisted living facility and she has mild cognitive impairment, you'd like to prevent a stroke because that's going to make her 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 care much more complicated. So she may be, you know, mildly cognitive impaired, but she can, you know, get, get you know get up, get dressed, go out, uh, go to the dining room, um, uh, it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The way she is, so you'd like to prevent a stroke in that in that person. Okay, so here are some anti, you know, some pearls that we gathered about, uh, regarding antithrombotic therapy. Number one. Atrial fibrillation is never a one-time occurrence. It will always return. Stroke rates, uh, uh, we've talked about the risk of uh, uh, chronic stroke, uh, chronic AFib being greater than that of uh, intermittent or paroxysmal AFib. Uh, uh, the pattern frequency or amount of AFib does not influence long-term anticoagulation decisions. Uh, uh, AFib ablation or the use of antiarrhythmic drugs does not allow discontinuation of oral anticoagulation, and the risk of clot formation exists with atrial flutter. Uh, and again, aspirin doesn't count. Uh, so back to this patient. Here's a 54-year-old uh, man. Uh, would you anticoagulate this guy? Well, I certainly wouldn't give him aspirin because that's not going to do anything. Anticoagulate, yes or no? Okay. I have two no's. Um, well, you certainly could not anticoagulate him. Um, uh, I heard a talk by uh, Peter Zimmerbaum, who, who was the uh, AFib guru uh, at Beth Israel. Um, uh, uh, a, a, the AFib guru at uh, Beth Israel, uh, uh, who said that he probably would uh, anticoagulate most, most people like this. Okay, so now let's turn to uh, rhythm control versus rate control. Uh, 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 there are a number of factors which uh, impact whether you will uh, favor rate control or rhythm control. Uh, one is patient preference. Uh, older patients favor rate control versus younger. Uh, longer history of AFib favors rate versus shorter history favors rhythm. Fewer symptoms Papers rate control versus more symptoms, uh, the more symptomatic um, favors, favors rhythm control. Uh, you know, whether the heart rate is easily controlled. What is the left atrial size? A smaller left atrium fa favors rhythm control. A larger left atrium uh, favors rate control. Uh, 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 LV dysfunction. Uh, and uh, 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 a a AV valve regurgitation. So the rate control strategy, <clears throat> first-line drugs are di uh, beta blockers in the non-dihydropyridine. Uh, whoops, I, I, there's, a, there's a typo there. Sorry about that. <laughs> the bane of my existence is typos. I go over these things and go over them, <laughs> and then I come to put it up, and there it is in, in, in you know, larger than life, uh, a misspelling. <laughs> uh, so non-dihydropyridine um, uh, CCVs, but not with uh, left ventricular ejection fractions of less than 40. Uh, second line drugs would be the Joxin or amiodarone. Uh, there's, there's not a strict target, uh, you know, a lean, a lenient target if the, if the ejection fraction is preserved, uh, but uh, many people will require two or more drugs and you should, 
uh, uh, obtain serial electrocardi uh, echocardiograms in order to assure uh, stable left ventricular function. Uh, looking at treatments to reduce AFib uh, burden, so in other words, um, rate, uh, rhythm control, okay? If there's not heart failure, then either antiarrhythmic drugs or catheter ablation uh, are the modalities uh, which we should we, which we would pursue uh, among the antiarrhythmic drugs? Uh, uh, Flecainide and propafenone are the generally the first choices, providing the patient uh, doesn't have um, uh, heart disease. Uh, catheter ablation uh, would be indicated certainly indicated as a class one indication if the antiarrhythmic drugs are ineffective. Um, uh, but it can be used as first-line therapy for selected patients. Uh, uh, and then in fa heart failure, uh, consider, uh, you know, consider cardioversion. Okay, plus one indication uh, or, or rate control. Uh, th those who are likely to benefit from uh, 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 catheter ablation are people with uh, AFib-mediated cardiomyopathy, uh, earlier stages of heart failure, uh, uh, you know, no or mild atrial fibrosis, uh, paroxysmal or early persistent AFib, and younger patients. Less likely to benefit patients with heart failure and AF who are less likely to benefit from catheter ablation are those in advanced heart failure, failure have significant scar, have significant uh, atrial myopathy, uh, long-standing per, uh, persistent AFib, <clears throat> uh, or uh, and prior failed uh, ablations and advanced age or, or multiple comorbidities. Okay, so this is uh, uh, DC cardioversion. What are the indications? Certainly hemodynamic instability. Uh, uh, everybody probably deserves one shot uh, at sinus rhythm if they don't convert spontaneously, uh, especially people who are symptomatic uh, and who have a potentially reversible cause. Here's a picture of a cardioverter. Uh, some reasons not to cardiovert would be patients who are totally asymptomatic, particularly older, particularly over the age of 80, uh, who are minimally or not or asymptomatic, <clears throat> and uh, are patients who are, have a low likelihood of a successful cardioversion or a, a low likelihood of the maintenance of a sinus rhythm. Okay. Dr. Shulman, this is your 15-minute warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, the risk... Uh, of uh, thromboembolism uh, uh, exists with cardioversion and basically depends on what the what the Chad's vas score is. Uh, the goals of rhythm control are uh, to re uh, especially in reduced LV function and persistent AFib, uh, uh, AFib and heart failure uh, or symptomatic AFib. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the drugs I've already mentioned, so I'll just skip that and uh, just show you this patient, a uh, 78-year-old woman who presented with palpitations, uh, shortness of breath, and edema. She was hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, her ejection fraction was 24%. Uh, she was cardioverted to normal rhythm. Uh, and uh, a repeat echo the next day was uh, better, but not normal. Um, you know, three weeks later, the AFib recurred, uh, and amiodarone was started. Uh, a month later, her ejection fraction was the same. Okay, she's still in atrial fibrillation. Finally, uh, uh, so this is all, all, three months later, uh, she was cardioverted to normal sinus rhythm, where she remained. And when she was in sinus rhythm, her echo ejection fraction was 61%. So this is tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Uh, 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 you know, this is uh, uh, ablation, percutaneous, 
uh, pulmonary vein isolation. The optimal candidates are those who are symptomatic, who failed at least one drug. Uh, there's a 70 to 75% reduction in symptoms, although 10 to 15% likely need a second procedure. Uh, uh, their risk of complications is uh, pretty low. Um, you know, most people will feel better. Most will have reduction in the burden of AFib. Uh, the long-term efficacy is not so well known, and many people will remain on an antiarrhythmic drug. It is not curative. It cannot be performed as a way to get off anticoagulation. Uh, and this is, this is the Beth Israel approach uh, to uh, rhythm control. Uh, so if you have symptomatic AFib uh, associated with LV dysfunction or heart failure, or persistent AFib at a young age, regardless of symptoms, so that 54-year-old man might very well be a candidate for, for an ablation. Um, um, okay, uh, so the treatment would be either with an antiarrhythmic drug, but more likely uh, in these scenarios with ablation or uh, a second ablation, uh, if there are AFib, you know, post-second ablation, uh, and, and an antiarrhythmic drug. Um, so here, here was our patient uh, with AFib for a year. Uh, he would be a great candidate for cardioversion or ablation. Uh, you know, he would not be a great candidate for cardioversion. He's already had AFib for a year. On the other hand, uh, he would be a candidate for ablation. Okay. This is just to remind you that the uh, atrial flutter has the same issues uh, as uh, atrial fibrillation, rate versus rhythm control, and the prevention of thromboembolism. Uh, this is a, a, an ECG with typical atrial flutter. So these are the flutter waves, right? The sawtooth pattern in leads 2, 3, and ADF, uh, typical for atrial flutter. And so finally, uh, the uh, atrial fibrillation, better care, the ABC pathway. Anticoagulation and avoiding strokes, better symptom control, and addressing comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factor management. With, these, with this approach, there's a considerable uh, benefit. And so I, this is my parting shot. <laughs> and thank you very much. And I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Shulman, for that wonderful presentation. Very informative. Um, we have several questions that I would like you to address. The okay. first one comes from Lena, um, and it asks, um, even short-term insights like for an acute injury should be avoided. For with short-term or long-term use, are topical NSAIDs okay like diclofenac? Diclofenac, diclofenac is supposed to have less absorption uh, into the bloodstream than, um, uh, than our oral NSAIDs. So I think it's, it's better. Uh, I, would, I would try to keep its use as short as you can, however. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a big problem. Somebody, you know, an older person with AFib uh, on anticoagulation who has, uh, you know, severe osteoarthritis and is in pain. Uh, I have, at times, uh, reluctantly uh, prescribed tramadol for people like that with some success. Um, and you have another, I see two other questions here. Yes, the second question, also from Lena, is cycloninsaprine contraindicated in a patient with AFib or any kind of arrhythmia up to date says it is? Um, uh, I do acute telehealth and get a lot of patients with mus musculoskeletal pain. What medications are safe to offer for patients with any history of arrhythmia? Tylenol, <laughs> Acetam acetaminophen, uh, heat, uh, ice. Uh, what medications? Uh, I, I I tend not to to use uh, uh, muscle relaxants 
uh, mostly because I don't think they're terribly effective. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's a lot, there are a lot of uh, muscle relaxants which are uh, prescribed. Um, I, I, I personally question the, the value. And the final question from Lena, thank you for answering that question, Dr. Shulman, um, is do the new COVID variants or any of the COVID vaccines cause increased risk of arrhythmia like AFib? No. The, the, the short answer, the short answer, the vaccines don't, no. Um, uh, you know, if you had COVID myocarditis that was severe, that you could have a risk for atrial fibrillation. But uh, most COVID today is uh, not anywhere near that bad. Thank you. Uh, I have I have two other questions, which I think you I do. You actually have three. Um, the next one comes from uh, Bonnie Sudler. How often uh, do you have echo? Do you have to echo to? Let's see. How often do you need to echo? To, how often do you need to to echo the to, to monitor the development of L, uh, left ventricular dysfunction? My answer to that is about once a year. Uh, you know, have I seen cases of uh, papilledema uh, with amiodarone? No, I haven't. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't take place, but I have never seen that. No, um, uh, the vast majority of people tolerate amiodarone pretty well. Uh, and then the final question: How do you define periodic supraventricular ectopy? Uh, how do I define it in a in a sixty four year old woman? Uh, uh, I would only, uh, I would not do anything about uh, uh, atrial ectopy. Is it a concern for AF? It might be a precursor for AF, but there's no treatment. Um, uh, it's certainly not, uh, uh, there's no thromboembolic risk um, if, if the patient doesn't have a fib. Um, uh, you know, if a patient is symptomatic, you could consider like a beta blocker to see if that makes a difference, a low dose beta blocker, to see if that makes a difference. There are a few more questions. Um, oh. Have you seen any cases of papilledema with amiodarone? I have not. Okay. And then um, another question is for patients with intermittent AFib, do you ever use drugs like flecainide, PRN? That's a good question. Uh, and it's a question that's being, that's being studied. Uh, I think it's, I, I'm not sure it's ready for prime time, if you know what I mean. But, um, uh, and it's not in, 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 uh, the, in the guidelines, but a number of electrophysiologists have studied whether people who have rare intermittent paroxysmal AFib might be treated with the so-called pill-in-the-pocket approach. That is, they have AFib, they're given uh, flecainide to try to convert them back to normal rhythm uh, and leave them on that for a month or so, anticoagulate them for about a month or so, and then stop it. Uh, that's being tested now. I got it. But, uh, but being tested, but it hasn't been reported to my knowledge. I have one, uh, two more questions. Um, how often does amiodarone cause tremors? Cause tremors? Not very often. There are there are people who absolutely don't tolerate amiodarone. They feel awful. But uh, the, those, my, my experience is most, most people tolerate it pretty well, especially in the doses that we use uh, for atrial fibrillation. Amiodarone is an interesting drug uh, uh, because it is, does not have an FDA-approved indication for atrial fibrillation. Go look it up. It's approved for serious ventricular arrhythmias, and yet it's almost never used for that. It's almost always used for AFib. And I have one final question. Is cyclobenzaprine contraindicated 
um, some patients request it. Uh, is it contraindicated with, with uh, uh, you mean uh, in an anticoagulated patient? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd have to that, I, that one. I'd have to look up. I don't know. Uh, one of one of you told me that uh, up to date says it is. So I'll think. <laughs> she said with AFib. Is it yeah. contraindicated with AFib? With AFib. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not with AFib. It's with a, with the anticoagulation. That's where the problem is. Awesome. If, if, I don't if, see you, if you want to give me the my email is right here. If you want to give me your email address, I'll I'll be glad to uh, give you an answer to that when I can research it. Send me an email. Awesome. Are there any additional questions? Well, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's ed session. Thank you, Dr. Schulman. Please be sure that you complete the CMA survey um, following the conclusion of this session. And I hope you all have a great day. Uh, okay. Okay. T take care. Uh, and, and thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.